Hello, everyone. I'm experimenting with my lighting, so it's apparently not working the way I thought. So I apologize for. No, I can't get. Yeah, I'll work on it some more. <coughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started. Let's uh, make the mudra, please, and we'll offer the mandala. Here is the great earth filled with the smell of incense and covered with a blanket of flowers. The great mountain, the four continents, wearing a jewel of the sun and the moon. In my mind, I make them the paradise of the Buddha and offer it all to you. By this deed, may every living being experience the pure world. Iram Guru Ratna Mandalakam Niryatayame. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, compassion, knowledge, and strength the Dharma, the enlightened side of truth, and the song of the community of realized beings. From the virtuous merit I create, from the practice of giving with the understanding of emptiness, moral discipline with the understanding of emptiness, patience with the understanding of emptiness, joy separate with the understanding of emptiness, concentration and wisdom, I will attain the state of, I, I may I attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all, of all living beings. <coughs> I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, compassion, knowledge, and strength, the Dharma, the enlightened side of truth, and the song of the community of realized being. From the virtuous merit I create, from the practice of giving with the understanding of emptiness, moral discipline with the understanding of emptiness, patience with the understanding of emptiness, joy of suffer with the understanding of emptiness, concentration, and wisdom, may I attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all living beings. I go for refuge in time and light to the Buddha, compassion, knowledge, and strength, the Dharma, the enlightened side of truth, and the song of the community of realized beings. From the virtuous merit that I create from the practice of giving with the understanding of emptiness, moral discipline with the understanding of emptiness, patience with the understanding of emptiness, joy of effort with the understanding of emptiness, concentration, wisdom, I will attain the state of a Buddha for the benefit of all living beings. Okay, let's see. We're going to have everybody try and find a three spheres example in their life between last class and this class. So let's start with Mike. Did that, you be able to do that, Mike? Yeah, I can do it. <clears throat> um, so three spheres, let's see here. Uh, um okay so here's one um for uh i'm just like taking this out of my book um so i have for like no killing and protect life um making a vegetarian meal choice. Um, and like the three spheres of that would be my view of knowing that I am making a vegetarian choice in order to protect the life and knowing that that will cause, will add to a cause for my future enlightenment. And then the actual meal itself is empty so like my view of the meal isn't the only that there's not some self-existent meal out there um that means anything of its own nature and then the third sphere it, i always have trouble with the third sphere it's like whose opinion like who's other who is the other opinion or something like that um but i guess it would be like the third sphere could just be like any other person and like how they would see the same meal. And like, you know, would they consider eating a chicken Parmesan sandwich, killing something, or would they just say I'm hungry and like yeah. have at it? Yeah. yeah. No, very good. I think you know, the third sphere is often difficult for me to, uh, to come up with too, because it seems like I'm repeating one of the other two. But that's a good a good example. Chicken parmesan. Ooh, I make a uh, tofu parmesan, 
it's actually really pretty good. But I'll send you the recipe if you want it. Mm -hmm. I'd love it, yeah. actually. Oh, okay. Well, I'll make a... Well, I'll tell it to you now. What the heck? Here's the, my recipe for tofu parmesan. You take a, a brick of firm, extra firm tofu. You freeze it. Then you thaw it and you gently squeeze the uh, tofu, like using your hand on the top and press down. That'll, that'll get all the water out of it. And then it gives it a nice texture. Then you cut it into four slabs and you dip it in. So this isn't vegan, this is vegetarian. Then you dip it in egg batter, then in, in breadcrumbs and cook it like you would normal Parmesan with a slab of mozzarella cheese and some mushroom tomato sauce. And that's, that's pretty good eats. Okay, who's up next? On my other side is Svetlana. So Svetlana, what do you have for uh, rejoicing today? Hey, hello there, venerable Samati. Hello, everyone. Uh, about rejoicing, I would uh, share my experience at job, maybe, uh, practicing patience. There was some situation that I was asked by my boss to do some job that would save his time and his efforts. And it was to figure out something in Excel. So, and like I figured out some formula that was like the most correct one. And like, I was so of exciting that this formula is correct. We should do this one, etc. And they started uh, like boss and his like also middle boss starting like tell me no here like should be this formula and he also like supported like we should do this we should do this th this way and internally it was so difficult like what but i was feeling like okay i should become whatever they are telling it's just like they are returning emotional this uh, emotionally this seats to me and then when I did, just kept this uh, calmness, uh, uh, the situation started to change. Uh, they just calmly admitted, oh, actually, this for your formula is right. You're correct. Okay, let's go further. <laughs> and uh, of course, at the end of the day, like I was a, a little bit like worrying why they're talking like this, like... Uh, I'm not caring about how you will do. I need just it to be done, etc. But I understand that uh, I tried to understand that actually they are very, very good people, and I I admire very lots of their qualities and all those negativities that is like uh, I am perceiving them in this way, and I, like I just decided this that this day is going to be a brand new day, not to make any stories about how they this, they are doing me to this or that. And today it was wonderful. It was so peaceful and they are supporting me and telling me like, do this, this, this. And then we have a group discussion all together, how to be as a team and support each other. And they even like tell, if we implement this, it will help you about your flat sweater. So, about your accommodation issue <laughs> like this so they're even supporting uh, each other and the atmosphere just changed so i'm rejoicing that um, implementing wisdom at the moment and not um, to create self-existent stories can help us um, to change uh, what was <laughs> unchangeable before maybe <laughs> Well, that's exactly the point of the, the exercise. I'm really proud of you. That's a, that's happening right there in real time. So very good. That's putting into practice what I teach. And and uh, that's, that's just really beautiful. Well done. Okay. Katya. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, this week I had some problems with technology and my cell phone stopped working and my laptop uh, was very slow so some things that i spend like two hours in do it they i spend it four hours so i think that i came a little bit impatient and um, 
and <laughs> and I think that I was wasting my time. But the emptiness of a uh, see of of me, of or the emptiness is in me having a uh, obstacles and impassion, and um uh, and as a result of the ways that the the yeah the as a result of the of the many uh, days or actions that I do with someone else that I'm uh, an obstacle for some other other people. And uh, seeing the laptop and the cell phone not working is also a self is not self existing, and it's the cause of a uh, some other things like like, like my my feet, and uh, the action in, is, uh, that I start doing is instead of clicking and and turn off and turn off the the computer and and uh, this is great. I stop and I stop uh, start planting the seeds of a uh, passion and and I just uh, wait for the computer to work faster. Very good. That's a tough one. It's a, a panic time when your computer doesn't work. Um, I had well, I'll I'll discuss that in a bit. Very good. Very good. It's um. These are one reason to do this particular exercise is to catch yourself before you do something karmically that's going to be an issue. And I think you picked one of the toughest ones, the reflexive response to, oh, my God, my computer's not working or my cell phone. Uh, so very good. OK, Daria, you're up. Good morning, Nubarbo Smati. I need help, Olga. <laughs> I will help. I have three uh, rejoice. I got the book by Lama Sarani, and now I'm reading it. Second. Joyce, yesterday I was in hospital and I saw a grandfather, he is 91 years old and he had, he had very high, high pressure, he felt very sick. Doctors helped him and I came and I talked to him. He started to speak with me, he told me that his whole life. And I listened to him and I did Tong Leng to him. And I was so happy for him that he became better. No, very good. And today I, I'm very happy that I also came to this hospital, to the room, and there were women. And for the women, they, they couldn't do their injections. And I just imagined that like Buddha med medicine near us, I just imagined it. And I imagined four kings who helped us. And I imagined that all this unhappiness uh, goes away and everything is changing. Then some and then the situation started to change. The injections were easy to make for these women, and it became quicker, and I was so happy for them. So this is my rejoice. Very good. Very good. That's an interesting three-sphere story. I like that. I really like that. I may have to try and remember that and use that in my teaching because it's, it's an example of someone saying, oh, it can't be because it happened so quickly. That's not how karma works. To which I would say, who, are you a Buddha? Do you know that? I like to think instead your karma ripened very quickly for everything to work beautifully for him because of how strong your practice is. So very good. Okay, Alexander. Yes, 
Martin. Yeah, hello, whenever it's Martin. Um, so I'm was late. So should we talk about this three spheres example? Or yes, yes, that's what we're talking about. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking about the three spheres when I was helping our son Maximilian when he swallowed the metal wire last week. And I myself, in helping my son, I'm empty of any uh, self-existence, which means I that I exist as I do uh, in this moment is a projection in, um, forced upon me by my results of my past deeds. And when I think about this principle then and, and continuing helping others and, and him, uh, then I can eventually, or I will realize myself as an enlightened being later. And yeah, then the second, this was the first sphere. The second sphere, Maximilian, my son, who I was helping, uh, is also empty of any self-existence. Um, so he exists as he does as a projection forced upon me uh, on my past karma. And when I'm continuing helping him, uh, this helps me to see him or perceive him later as, as high being in my global paradise. Um, yeah, and then the, the third sphere, the whole situation while I, while I was helping Maximilian is, was also empty or is empty uh, of any self-existence and exists as it uh, was or is uh, as a projection again. And like we had a hospital available and also a car to get there and also doctors to help uh, help him. So um, this was also forced upon me by my past deeds. In this, in this case, a good, also good uh, deed. And so when I continue to help, then I will see, this helps me to see such situation later um, as an action or, of an enlightened being to, who has the capability to help all living beings. This, yeah, this is my, this is my understanding of the three spheres. I hope that's correct. Good. That's a good example. The fact that because Maximilian is empty of self-existence, he can change, he can get better. If he was out there coming at you as a self-existent Maximilian, he couldn't get any better because he's self-existent. He can't change. So you you have the karma to have the people there to help you, and you have Maximilian there to get to get the aid. And then you have you observing it, and someone could be saying, "Well." What kind of parent let their son get a hold of something and swallow it like that? And I, don't, I just say someone might think that. Well, they don't know the circumstances. And so to, to blame them or for them to blame you is ignorant. So I think you that's a good example with Maximilian and the hospital staff. So well done. Thank you. Okay. Mike, we've done. Anna. Hello, Venerable Samadhi. Hello, everyone. About three spheres, I um, was thinking about three spheres when I uh, got a new book. Uh, it's uh, Katrine by Gesha Michael Roach. And I was thinking about uh, people who uh, sent it to me. Uh, it's uh, internet uh, shop in internet. I just uh, uh, bought it uh, and uh, me. So uh, I, I want this book. I got it, but uh, I am empty. Uh, people who sent it to me also empty. I even uh, didn't uh, see them because uh, I don't know them. Uh, and most interesting things about uh, 
uh, the book uh, when I uh, I'm reading this book I have my own insights my own understanding of this text if somebody else will read the same book even if I give somebody my book uh, this person will see something uh, especially for uh, them especially interesting and understanding for them so book also empty and that's three spheres of emptiness for me that's interesting because that book is packed full of of examples and you're right someone could look at it and say this book is dumb uh, another person can look at it and say this book is too long Another person could look at it and say, wow, this is exactly what I need. And the fact that there are stories makes it all the better because at the risk of sounding kind of strange, our whole world is a story. So to say that the stories are fictional and, and not appropriate is, is just simply ignorant. So very good. And Daria, I want to thank you for getting a copy of my lovely wife's book. I will share that with her and she'll be very excited. Okay, who's next? Um, Evgeny. Hello, everyone. My story is the following. I... I uh, he, every day I heal my dog because uh, my dog is ill, and in this situation I uh, see myself as empty. I'm empty of self-existence, and I have the dog, and my dog is empty by itself. My dog is ill. I don't know whether she is ill or not, but for me I think that she is ill. But when some enlightened being will see my dog. Enlightened being will say that this dog is uh, absolutely like uh, okay, and maybe I created such kind of karma so as to heal my dog and to have health in future. And also the drugs that I give to my dog, it uh, doesn't uh, work by itself. I have karma to see my dog. Uh, who eats uh, these drugs, this medicine, and I see that this medicine works, and I created this situation, because this situation is empty by itself, because when I will give this medicine to some other dogs or cats, they it will not help them. So like this. Good. Yes. Good. I hope your dog feels better. It's the the fact the medicine works or doesn't work is your dog's karma and your karma and the karma of of seeing it all come together. So very good. Okay. Olga, are you gonna have a uh I sorry, I will translate, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. No <laughs> no problem. You. Thank you. Tatiana. Tatiana wrote in the chat that she is doing injection to her mom. Oh, ooh, don't want to get in the middle of that. Okay. Okay, well, let's go ahead and start class. I have to leave at 11.15. I think we'll be done. This is a fairly short class, but okay. So this class is about teaching, reaching your Buddha paradise. We're going to get a drachi or a mental picture of something we have not seen so we can begin to create our own dunchi or mental image that we can project and eventually get to our Buddha paradise. So next in the Diamond Cutter Sutra, if you went to a meditator and asked them what they were doing and they say, oh, I'm trying to produce my Buddha paradise. Lord Buddha says, any bodhisattva who says such a thing is not speaking true. Meaning, of course, if they are saying this is independent of their projections forced by their karma, then the person speaking falsely. 
they could be thinking they can imagine it into existence. And this is not possible because I don't know about you, but I can't imagine enlightenment. I have no, I have no, no clue what it would be like. If they understand perfectly how they're creating the future paradise, because they're creating its causes during their meditation. So how does one reach their Buddha paradise? The scriptures describe how Lord Buddha reached his. He was a bodhisattva at the final moment of his non-Buddha existence. He was staying in Ganden as visitor in the heaven of bliss. We have no words to describe this, and our minds are too limited to even imagine it. He leaves an emanation of himself in Ganden paradise. He manifests his Dharmakaya, the wisdom essence, in Oakman, the highest Buddha paradise. He manifests because of the emptiness of an enlightened being's mind, which does not grow or develop, but exists totally and completely when the thing that is empty exists and disappears when the thing is destroyed. So he's remembering the emptiness of his Buddha mind. He enters the emanation he left at Ganden, and then he enters his mother's womb. He acts out the other 11 deeds of a Buddha. There are a total of 12. So this is a little confusing. So I wanted to go through the... 12, well, let me see, I'm ahead of myself. This always happens. Um, you you see on the screen Buddha, right? Okay. I forgot I wanted to review this. So the four bodies of a Buddha. You have the Rupakaya or form body. And this is a good way to remember if you can remember this slide, you'll never forget the bodies of the Buddha. You have the Dharmakaya or wisdom body. So if someone says, what are the two bodies of the Buddha? They're Rupakaya and Dharmakaya. The Rupakaya has two bodies within it. The Nirmanakaya or the emanation body. And the Sambhogakaya or enjoyment body. So the Nirmanakaya is the emanation body, that which we see if the Buddha is emanating to me as one of you, then I'm seeing the Nirmanakaya. The enjoyment body is the body I would have in my Buddha paradise, and it stays in the Buddha paradise. The Dharmakaya has two, the Sabhavakaya, the essence body, which is a little hard to describe and the Janata Dharmakaya, or wisdom body. So, Buddha has two bodies, Rupakaya and Dharmakaya, or he has the four bodies, the Nirmanakaya, Sabokakaya, Svabhavakaya, and Nada Dharmakaya. Okay, so back to where, let's see, where was I? Oh. So, the 12 acts of a Buddha. He comes first, the Buddha comes to our world from the heaven of bliss. So this is describing Lord Buddha coming to our, our planet. Lord Buddha descends from Tushita heaven where he is staying to our planet. And I think my next slide, there. Coming into our world from the heaven of bliss he enters the womb of his holy mother, takes birth from her womb, masters of worldly arts. This refers to the 64 fine arts, which include reading and writing, scholastic sciences, archery, medicinal arts, elephant riding, swimming, painting, and lots of other things. They represent the necessary administrative and worldly skills required of a prince and future king to run a kingdom. Then, enjoying himself with the queens, 
engaged in pleasurable activities with his retinue of queens. Now, don't forget, at this point, he is not enlightened from our side. He then leaves the worldly life. This is where Lord Buddha left the palace to become a yogi. Then he undertakes spiritual hardships. Lord Buddha spent six years with Hindu ascetics, engaging in extreme practices like starvation and piercing his body with spears and burning his body. These were thought by some to aid in enlightenment back then, but we actually, in the uh, tantric vows, have a vow not to harm ourselves in this manner. The next one is coming to the seat of the diamond, the heart of enlightenment. The heart of Buddha has two meanings. The physical heart of Buddhahood, the seat of the diamond, is Bodh Gaya, India. The mental essence, the second part is the mental essence and enlightenment itself. Here it refers to going to the physical place, Bodh Gaya. This is where Lord Buddha gave up his ascetic practices. He went to Bodh Gaya and sat down under the Bodhi tree and defeated the army of demons that were sent there to distract him. Then he attained total enlightenment and turned the wheel of Dharma for us. And lastly, pretending or appearing to pass into final nirvana. So these, this is information is not in your, your notes, uh, student notes. This is from a Tantra class I'm teaching, but I wanted to put these seeds in your mind, the 12 deeds of a Buddha. So there you got it. According to the highest school, Buddhas get enlightened in Oakman Paradise and out, act out the deeds of a Buddha in order to teach us. Several things happen at the first moment of your enlightenment. Let's see, I think I have a page for that. Yeah. You achieve your paradise because you made the causes. You have to be somewhere when you reach your enlightenment. There is a specific practice, Pure Land practice, where we learn specific practices to achieve your own paradise. And believe it or not, one of the practices is keep your bedroom neat and tidy. Another one is taking care of the physical places of Dharma facilities. So if you want to get some massively good karma, help a Dharma center keep itself in good shape. So you think about this, and uh, I was extremely lucky extremely lucky to be involved in building out Diamond Mountain. That's an enormous good karma uh, for me. And so that's hopefully going to power me <laughs> into seeing emptiness directly one of these days. Okay. He directly perceives the totality of knowable things. That's omniscience. You end the third suffering, aging and death, and you do not have to worry about which karma is going to ripen next because all you've got is virtue and merit ripening, and that's all joyous. Next, you bring forth your dharmakaya. The, the four bodies of the Buddha we just talked about. And next, this one's the, the cool one for me. You, do, you see deceptive and ultimate reality simultaneously.
your body becomes the enjoyment body, a rainbow body which is visible but not made of atoms, no organs, etc. It's more subtle than light, but it's usually called the light body. You achieve a cause for what will become in the next moment, the ability to emanate countless selves. In this case, Lord Maitreya, whoops, Lord Maitreya emanates into his mother's womb and, that's, and thus starts the 12 deed cycle. Now, the homework asks, why doesn't the truth of seven exist in the Buddha par in, in Lord Buddha, in your Buddha paradise? A suffering place can only be made by having the karma from past wrong deeds and mental afflictions that result from the ripening of that karma. So if we just get rid of the old karma and stop our mental afflictions, we'll be on our way to paradise, and that's what nirvana is. So what are the two causes of a paradise? There's prayer, action plan for reaching your total alignment, and then there are the good deeds, the virtues, as a fuel to get you there. Another reason why the truth of suffering is not in your paradise, because it was created from virtuous deeds, not karma and mental afflictions, which are the cause of suffering. So if you get rid of your mental afflictions, then your the truth of suffering is no longer something you would see in your paradise. Now, do you see, do you see Here's a, a question I have a little trouble with. Would I still see as a Buddha? Would I still see suffering? It's just that I don't have suffering in my paradise. But to me, it seems like if I see suffering, then I'm going to be suffering because I'm worried about the person suffering. But as a Buddha, I would know that that's, that person's going to reach their enlightenment at some time, and they'll become fully enlightened and end all their suffering. So I'm not suffering to see them suffering because I know they're going to stop their suffering. So the surest way to stop karma and mental afflictions from ruining your life is simply to have the direct perception of emptiness. Everything exists as this undescribable potential to be anything our karma forces us to see it as. If everything has the, the potential to be pure, we need to start doing deeds to generate merit, to project things as pure. The six perfections is our tool for that. Now, the other tool we need are the four forces of purification. And we went through that recently, but I'm going to go through it again. So the force of refuge. This is the foundation, the ground from which you push yourself back up after you realize you've fallen into and you've fallen into doing something wrong. You know it's wrong, you know it's going to bring an unpleasant result that will delay your, your total enlightenment. And there's the next, which is the force of regret. This is the intelligent regret of an educated Buddhist. The fact that you know you say to yourself, oops, that was that was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. And why you you're not you're not upset about doing it for because of somebody else thinking about it. You know what you did, and you know that you have to do something to uh, make up for that. You know you just planted a seed in your mind that will create circumstances in your future, and so you need to do something about it right now. The force of restraint. Purification only works if you stop replanting the seeds. You must not lie 
to your own mind if you're working on habitual behavior. So this is my common example. And I'm doing much better with it, but that's partly because I'm not driving. For me, anger about drivers is what I work on the most. And, and I do not say I will never get mad again, but I give myself an extended, extending period of time. So now when I go out with someone driving to an appointment, I think to myself, from now until the appointment, I'm not going to have an opinion about someone self-existently being stupid enough to use their phone while they're driving. I'm going to think instead when I see that person using the phone that they're in an emergency situation because one of their children just got hurt at school and they have to go pick them up and take them to the hospital. Instead of thinking, oh, that idiot, he could cause an, a, a collision. He could get hurt. And the force of the antidote, the makeup activity. The highest is to study emptiness, study how to achieve the direct perception of emptiness. You can make zatsas, you can paint tankas, but Keshe Michael says the highest is to study emptiness and the perfection of wisdom. The sutras state if you do the four powers of purification, you will well, you can damage the seed. The diamond cutter sutra says this as well. The key is, is that you damage it. Don't make it go away with the four forces of purification. Now, I read recently hmm, my notes for a little bit. I read recently that you and I'm trying to remember where I put this reference. The four powers of purification, if done properly, which is hard to do, uh, if done properly, can stop a karmic seed from ripening. So when we say karma and the four laws of karma, It will ripen. That's unless you do the four powers of purification perfectly. So my notes are. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So we can't envision a Buddha paradise because it's like why a wish fulfilling a wish fulfilling jewel is only as good as your knowledge of what you want to wish for. And we can't use a wish-fulfilling jewel to wish for something we don't know about. So if there was such a thing as wish-fulfilling jewel and I had it in my hand, I couldn't wish for enlightenment because I have no idea what enlightenment's like. So I can't shortcut it. I can't take a shortcut to become totally enlightened. What I need to do is, is get my karmic act together and then study emptiness and try and understand the process for becoming enlightened, which is a little bit confusing. Okay. Well, this is a little shorter than I thought it would be. So, the key to reaching your own paradise, obviously, is seeing emptiness directly.
And the key to see emptiness directly is to study emptiness. And the key for studying emptiness, one of the keys, is the Diamond Cutter Sutra. So we are in the process of reviewing this sutra to try and understand its importance in reaching our, our Buddha paradise. So as I've said before, imagine having very little introduction to the Dharma and sitting in a class on the Diamond Cutter Sutra. That's, uh, it was bewildering. But what we liked, really liked when we took the class from Geshe-la was the structure. We learn best if we have homeworks, quizzes, and finals. And so when we came across this, the ACI courses, the foundation courses, uh, it was like a, a miracle. The Geshe-la has started calling the ACI courses the foundation courses because he thinks that's a better term because everything we learn builds upon in the foundation. Each, each of the courses, the, the courses builds on the one before it. So it's none of them are, well, how can I put this? Each of the courses builds upon the one before it. So if you don't have the ones be before it, your foundation is, is shaky. And that's why their the courses are organized in the way they are, so they build on each other and gently introduce you to these ideas of karma and emptiness. If we took course six, and it was the first course you took in this series, I'd be willing to bet many of you would be totally lost and not pursue the, the Dharma. So the beauty of Lord Buddha's teachings is the fact that he taught to each of the types of students directly in, in the same class. Some students were had the karma to hear a Mahayana teaching. Some students had the karma to hear a Hinayana teaching. And some students just didn't hear much of anything and never came back. So well, as you're going through these studies, it's very important to keep track of the fact that each of the vows, each of the commitments build on each other. So never find yourself saying, oh, I don't have to follow that rule because I'm doing Mahayana practice. Every rule that you see or hear in the Hinayana continuum, the Mahayana practitioners obey and, and still follow. So if someone was to say, you're a Mahayana practitioner, you don't have to do those dumb things Hinayana practitioners do, then you know they don't know what they're talking about. It's like in the source of all my good when you get to the Bodhisattva room and you see that bonsai tree in the niche and I make it into a weeping willow because I like the fact that the weeping willow the uh, branches and leaves fall down and cover the entire plant, which to me symbolizes how each of the vows gets, as the vows get more and more pointed, and in some cases more difficult to keep. It's because they're building up on the, the roots, the trunk, and the leaves of the plant, and the leaves can't survive without the roots and the trunk of the tree and the branches getting the nourishment to them. So each of the sets of vows has a specific purpose and those purposes add together to the final end of the ordained vows. So that's it for today. Oh, I know what I need to tell you. So we have class on the uh, 7th, so next Tuesday. Then Geshe starts teaching. Geshe will be starting teaching on Friday. So we don't have class while Geshe is teaching Medicine Buddha. 
or so we have class on the seventh, and then class starts up again on the twenty first. So that's right, said Ma. Yeah, next class on Monday, Monday seventh. Yeah. Oh, do I have the wrong day? Not not use day. No. Right. Oops. Right. Okay. Monday the sixth. And then we start up again. Let me get my calendar. I can't. Monday go. the seventh and oh sorry. Monday the seventh and then on twenty first. Right. Monday the seventh. Okay. So we'll see you on Monday. Then we won't see you again until the 21st. And okay. Well, let's dedicate this. I'm really pleased with your examples of the three spheres. Uh, constantly work on it. That's part of what I consider to be vigilant. The vigilance with your, your Dharma practice. Always be looking for the three spheres of any situation because it, it'll help you understand where it's coming from and why it's important to constantly be thinking about it. And eventually you'll, you'll get to the point where it just becomes second nature to not only think about it, but to act as in the, with the three spheres in mind. Oh, I didn't get a chance to rejoice. I should do that. Well, here's a good example for me. Just before um, I started preparing for class, I got an email from the Air Force, and it said I had uh, some files I could pick up off of a secure server. There were nine files. And I thought to myself, Wow, nine files. I if this is what I think it is, this happened, this could these got declassified really quickly. Wow, I can't wait. <clears throat> so I, I went to the website and I downloaded them and I'm anticipating them being these files I really want. And they turned out to be photographs of something I'd asked the person on Air Force Base to look into for me. So I was really pleased. When I opened them and they were the photographs, I wasn't disappointed that they weren't the other uh, material I wanted. I rejoiced in the fact that somebody went to their, the trouble to do this favor for me. And that's, to me, that's a great example of the three spheres because I could have said, well, these aren't, these aren't what I wanted. That's not fair. And it's my karma ripening and it happened to ripen as another aspect of something I wanted. So keeping the three spheres in mind throughout the day is, uh, I think, really important and something I try to do as much as I can. Okay, let's dedicate. Oh, gurus, buddhas, bodhisattvas, please listen to what I now say. Just as all the previous sugatas generated the mind of enlightenment and practice in accordance with bodhisattva precepts, so shall I too, in order to benefit all that live, give birth to bodhicitta and follow its precepts. In all my lives, may I never live apart from my perfect lamas. May I bask in the glory of the Dharma. May I fulfill perfectly every level and path and reach then quickly the place where I become myself, the one who holds the diamond. Okay, we'll see you on Monday. And Katya, we'll see you for lunch on uh, the 10th. Do you like Indian food? Yes, I like it. Oh, well, we're going to go to an Indian restaurant that's in a, in a gas station of all places. It's called yeah. the Twisted Indian. And these people are just too much fun. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody and doing that. Thank you. Okay. If you have visited a really sweet candle shop, Mike Hoffman has a really nice website 
it's an ad for his website. I don't get any percentage of sales. So, Mike, we need to work on that. <laughs> you know, it's a really sweet website. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's really sweet. I like how simple it is to use, Mike. You don't have to go through layer and layer of clicks. There you go. Okay. Thank you. I just redesigned the whole thing. It took me a lot of time and effort. <laughs> so thank you. I talked to my wife about candles. She says if they're organic essences, I'm not sure what that means. Um, I'm going to ask her again what, what scent she might like, because I think it'd be nice to get one. Let me know. I'll send you something. Okay. Oh. Oh. Well, Diamond Mountain sells candles. Is that one yes, of your, that's awesome. Is that one of yours? Yeah, my candle. There's a there's one of my candles in Austria right now. Oh wow. All right. Now you can say international sales available. So cool. Nice. Thank you, Cornelia, for showing him that. That's really very sweet. Okay, um, we'll see each other on uh, Monday. Thank you again for being in my life and letting me teach you this material. It's, uh, it's a great honor. And thank you, Olga, for translating. Thank you so much. It's a big honor and pleasure. Okay, okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for teaching. Bye. Oh, it's my pleasure. Have a good day. Bye.